Welcome to our webinar. My name is Daria Kolarczyk and I'm representing AV Systems Marketing Team. Um, to start, I just want to share some technical details. Um, please feel free to uh, use the chat option to ask questions. We'll be answering some of them during a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If, by some, I mean, if we don't get to your question, we'll make sure to get back to you via email. Um, okay, let's uh, give everyone maybe one more minute and we will start. Okay, so I think we can start now. Uh, so, hello, welcome again if you've uh, just joined us. Um, the topic of our webinar today is Lightweight M2M and MQTT, Insights and Adoption Ease. Our, allow me to introduce our speakers, uh, Martin Nage, Product Director for IoT at AV System, and Samuel Hale, Analyst and IoT Implementation Specialist at MahNation. Uh, without further ado, Sam, passing the microphone to, to you now. Great, thank you, Daria, and thank you everyone for joining us today. So before we start off, just wanted to run through a quick agenda. So the very first thing we'll take a look at is sort of why, why we're here, why investigate Lightweight M2M and MQTT at all. Then we'll do a little bit of compare and contrast, um, some of the similarities and some of the differences between these two IoT implementations. Then um, I'll talk a bit about some of the results we saw in doing our in-lab hands-on test comparisons, um, comparing the Lightweight M2M stack with a uh, sample MQTT stack. And then last but not least, we will uh, take a look at some of AB Systems' new tools to help speed up um, your IG deployment and some of the adoption of Lightweight M2M in the broader market ecosystem. So, very first thing is, of course, why investigate Lightweight M2M and MQTT? And I think one of the one of the most important places to start here is that this sort of implementation choice, right, uh, determining what the best communications protocol is, both for your telemetry and for your device management, really informs a lot of what else is going to happen further down in the stack as you're sort of designing and architecting and starting to build out your specific IoT implementation. And it's particularly important because unlike some other software stacks out there in the market, uh, typically IoT solutions have longer life cycles and can be much more costly um, or even difficult to physically access, but can be much more costly to sort of update, change, and rework and refactor in the same way that you might typically, um, you know, change different software solutions or different communications protocols in other parts of your stack. So this is also typically one of the first entry points when people are making their sort of architectural decisions. So we think it's very important to investigate uh, from this context. Second point is that, you know, every enterprise wants to find the right balance between time to market, but also something that enables, you know, future-proof solutions, something that's extensible and capable and has, you know, a good sort of future plan forward as, uh, as time goes on. So, you know, you, you really want to make it not overly complicated, but you want to make sure that you're not cutting corners now that kind of maybe accelerates your time to market a little bit, but you pay for it heavily later, especially, you know, if your solution is successful and you're trying to scale it out or scale it up, um, you know, that's not the time where you want to be dealing with questions around changing protocols or doing sort of refactors of your, your core uh, communications protocol. So it's very important to decide this upfront. Um, and three, just to sort of reemphasize this one more time, you know, the choices you make now can limit the choices that you can make later. 
Um, and, you know, choosing a flexible and extensible stack from day one, while it may be slightly more complicated at times to get the, you know, your first you know, test or trial or POC up and running, it really can make your life uh, a lot better uh, as you iterate down the road. And then the very last reason um, we thought this is particularly important to do this sort of comparison is just sort of the lack of replicable quantitative data about the relative efficiencies and performance of, of lightweight M2M -M and MQTT, uh, both from a technical perspective, but also from a bit of a sort of business and implementation perspective. Um, we'll be talking more about the technical perspective today, although we have lots more details in the white paper, which we encourage you all to download and take a look at. Um, but yeah, those are sort of our reasons for why we're here and why we did this investigation into these two different stacks. Um, and now, I believe I hand it over to you, Marcin. Thanks, Sam, for this introduction. Now let's take a step back for a moment. Uh, connected cars is a simple example of a complex IoT system. As you know, uh, every car has a number of uh, IoT devices inside it, like a unit controlling collision avoidance, cruise control, operation of tires, and so on. They talk over uh, some local network with a central component that plays the role of, uh, of an IoT gateway. And this gateway is using a uh, mobile network to talk with the IoT service that is located in the cloud. Uh, in the same time, it's also important to understand that gateway can execute some custom logic as well. So it can be aggregating data coming from multiple devices. It can be filtering some information. It can be providing some artificial intelligence functionality to, to, to provide a quick input for the, for the devices in the car. And in the cloud, uh, we have the running IoT service that is responsible for uh, device for system management, for the monitoring, but also for the business logic of the, of the whole IoT service. And it's also important uh, to understand that, you know, I'm talking about the cloud service and cloud deployment, but identical system can also be deployed uh, in an on-premise scenario. So this is uh, the example of one car. And then you can think that there can be, you know, many cars on the road. Each of these cars can have multiple devices. So the number of devices in your IoT system can, can scale up very quickly. So uh, this calls, if you think about this uh, amount of devices, this calls for, a, for, for, for implementation of the device management and monitoring system. And if you, if you think what it means, then this actually re reduces to two general questions. How do I know that my system works correctly? And if I have to do something, how can I control my device? Then if you keep thinking about these uh, questions, then this raises considerations. First of all, it's about you know, hostile environment that uh, your device can be operating. There is a possibility that uh, your device gets compromised. What's next? What, 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 what happens then? Uh, do I know, do I have guarantee that my device is able to communicate securely? Then the second aspect is about need for monitoring. Do I know that everything is working properly? And finally, for management. So if my device is running, sometimes I need to update it because there are critical security bugs that needs to be fixed. Or sometimes I just have a new software that I want to update. And also, it's, also, it's possible that your device gets old uh, and you want to retire it or sometimes it stopped working for whatever reason and it's just enough to reset it. So all of, this, all of these things uh, fall into the category of management and they need to, they need to be addressed properly. If, if we think then further, then uh, with, with all these considerations uh, that, that we have done a moment ago, then we can talk about challenges of managing the, the big IoT system at scale. And we defined five categories of these challenges. First is security, security, and I say once more security. Uh, this is a challenge of, of paramount importance. These days, there are many threats. We are operating on constrained devices that lack security by design approach when, when building an applications. And in many of these devices, keys are not stored in a secure way. This poses threats of uh, the data spoofing, data tampering, 
user masquerading, device masquerading, denial of service attacks, and so on. And there is a there is a basically a need to there is a need to make sure that there is a secure registration of devices and secure authentication and communication. The second aspect is interoperability. We have different classes of devices uh, produced by different manufacturers using different communication protocols operating in heterogeneous networks. And they sometimes need to be integrated with third party solutions. So all of this calls for using open standards in order to avoid the situation of a vendor locking. The third challenge is about constrained devices. We have limited power, limited memory, limited connectivity and processing capabilities. So we must avoid uh, connection processing overheads. So we have to look for solutions that minimize these overheads. And whenever we are doing some operations on the devices, we have to do them in a smart way. So for example, if you are doing your firmware over the air update and your battery is just uh, supplied, uh, your device is, is driven by the battery supply and your battery is low, maybe it's not a good idea to do it at this moment because the device may for example run out of battery during this process and what will happen next then scalability another important aspect uh, if you talk about the scale it is impossible to track every single device you need to have a way to somehow group them and you need to think how to automate the whole process of management uh, monitoring of these devices provisioning and being able to discover uh, what's happening with them and and uh, the, the, this discovering what, what's happening and then in, in an automatic way and finally availability so this this these are two aspects to consider here availability of your device your device can be working fine no problem but there is also a whole network layer between your device and your iot management system so you need to make sure that the network is available you have uh, proper, you need to monitor it. You have proper mobile subscription. If you are using cellular network, your quota for the mobile subscription is not run out of. These are the challenges that we need to meet. And now I'm handing it over to Sam to talk about MQTT. Thank you, Marison. So yeah, so I think it's really interesting to hear about those, those challenges. And before we get into a little bit of you know, some of the different ways we can address them. Let's just take a, a top level view of what is MQTT and, and what is lightweight M2M. So as many of you are probably familiar, um, MQTT is a machine to machine or IoT connectivity protocol, which offers efficient lossless message delivery. And for better or for worse, it, is been, it has been and, and currently is really the de facto communications protocol um, used by enterprises deploying IoT. Um, MQTT has been around for a while. Um, it's been standardized for nearly a decade. Um, was originally developed uh, as a constrained network protocol, um, I believe in the oil and gas industry. Um, these days, 3.1.1 is, is sort of the de facto standard out there. Um, there is a version five, which does offer some new features. Although it's broadly the same underlying concepts um, in many ways, and we haven't really seen too much of that adoption of, of version five yet. So three one one is really what's what's out there in the wild right now. Um, I think one of the interesting things is that it is actually a very efficient protocol itself. It has very little overhead, but what's interesting is that it has a completely unstructured payload, and we'll get into a moment why that's particularly important. Um, but one of the other things to note about it is that MQTT uh, uses TCP as its underlying transport, which offers some benefits, but also a lot of limitations, specifically when we're talking about uh, constrained networks and you know power constrained or, or compute constrained devices. There are some extensions to MQTT, such as MQTT SN or MQTT for sensor networks, which does support UDP and IP transports, but unfortunately it's not very widely adopted um, and is not nearly as well sort of standardized in practice as it perhaps should be. Um, again, so we'll come back to that unstructured payload now. So I think it's important to note here too that MQTT uh, defines really just the the messaging layer itself. It doesn't say anything about what types of messages you should send or what types of messages you should expect if you're subscribing. So we'll take a look at the, um, 
well, and this is really, I guess the important part here is this is in contrast to lightweight M2M -M as well, where there is a much more defined specification around that. Um, and we'll get into that in a moment. The very last point to make around MQTT here is that um, it follows the, the publish, subscribe, broker-centric paradigm. So if we take a look at the next slide, we can see you know, a very simplistic layout of what an MQTT uh, message sort of lifecycle or workflow might look like. So we see on the left, we have our temperature sensor, which could be some IoT device or a gateway or whatever. And it communicates northbound to this MQTT broker. And it does that by publishing a message of some arbitrary contents to the broker itself. And from there, individual clients that are northbound of, of the broker, they subscribe to those topics. And whenever I publish a message to that topic, they then get a, they basically then receive the message themselves from the broker. So we support basically a, a fan out kind of architecture there. Um, and there are some other details uh, that can be involved here in terms of things like QoS levels and how you subscribe and some other uh, details, but this is sort of the overall big picture of, of what MQTT is like. So I think now we wanted to get into some more details of lightweight M2M, -M, so I'll hand that over to you, Marcin. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for this MQTT aspects. Uh, lightweight M2M, this is how, how is it called in the, with, with the full name. The standard, the protocol has been developed as part of this OMA spec works activities and the activity on this one started around year 2013. So quite many years after MQTT was developed and it was from scratch designed for supporting the, the type of machine to machine communication, especially for the remote management. What is in, important is that the architectural design closely, is clo closely based on the race idea, which makes it easy to be interoperable with web systems and HTTP protocol uh, running, 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 running under the running together with the with the co-op, and uh, Sam has mentioned that uh, MQTT does not define any payload information, whereas for for LWM two M we have an extensive amount of resources and data model that has been defined and standardized by IPSO. So if if you so basically in, in this approach you can just you know take whatever is standardized, uh, reviewed by, by people who work on the standards. So there is a, there is a high chance, you know, that, that this, this makes a lot of sense and you don't, you, you can just take it and, and it's not, it's not anything that you have to think about and, and reinvent the wheel. And finally, it is built on the data transfer protocol that is called constraint application protocol co-op, which is specifically optimized for usage in the constraint environments. If we take a look at the stack of the LWM2M and we take the top-down approach, on top we have the applica IoT application is running, and then this application is talking or managing the objects, which are part of the data model that is defined by IPSO. And then these objects are talking with the actual LWM2M protocol implementation. And this implementation is uh, provides four main interfaces interface for boot device bootstrapping. This is the phase where the, where the device is onboarded, the credentials are being passed to the device. And the interface of registration, so devices once in a while need to register to the server in order to, to so, so, that, so that you know the server can understand that the device is alive and everything is happening, is, is fine with it. Uh, interface for uh, device management and monitoring. And finally, for uh, information reporting. So we have all, all of these functionalities of management and messaging uh, on, this, on this layer. And then LWM2M runs on top of the co-op, as we have mentioned before. So co-op is the adaptation of the HTTP transport protocol for the, uh, for the constraint environments. So it's a lightweight binary encoded protocol. And what is interesting about it is that it's uh, interoperable with HTTP. So there are proxies that uh, make it easy to translate the co-op message into HTTP message and back. So this provides a good interoperability with, the, with this web part of the internet. Uh, this also means that much, all of the rest 
REST requests or REST messages that are uh, exchanged over HTTP can also be easily translated to co-op co messages. And as part of co-op, we have also OSCOR, which is the security protocol that provides end-to-end -end encryption on the application layer. And below co-op, we have the transport layer, and then we have, here we have multiple bindings to multiple transport protocols. Uh, there is UDP, and then on top of UDP, there can be a security layer provided by DTLS. There is TCP, and again, with the transport layer security TLS. There is transport over SMS, both on device and without any security, and on smart card, or on device pro, uh, secured with DTLS. And there are also bindings to non-IP data delivery with LoRaWAN and cellular IoT. So now let's co compare and contrast uh, MQTT and LVM2M, especially if we compare them with the challenges that we have set in the, in the beginning of this presentation. So if we, if we talk about security, there are two aspects that we are looking for. Uh, one is communication and the second is provisioning. If we talk about communication, then we have this transport layer security provided by the TLS and DTLS. We are putting this letter M here to emphasize that this is mutual authentication. The client is also authenticated, which is not the default operation of the TLS, the same for DTLS. And there is also OSCOR that provides application layer security. So this is especially important uh, because this is an end-to-end -end, uh, encryption of data. So for example, if, if you remember when I talked a moment ago about proxies, that proxies terminated the, the transport layer connection. So then the message would need to be decrypted and then re-encrypted again. So this prevents a uh, proxy server from, from, seeing the, from seeing the message on the way from the device to the client device to the server. And then uh, for the Raw MQTT, so this MQTT that is, is just with, without any structured payload, we have the TLS with the option to configure MTLS. And for the, uh, and then we have, we are also defining here a category for AWS IoT MQTT. This is the MQTT protocol provided by the AWS IoT service. So this is a sort of a custom protocol developed by AWS on top of on top of MQTT to provide the IoT service. And in this case, we have MTLS available by, by default. Then in terms of provisioning, we have the bootstrap interface that uh, provisioning is like uh, providing client credentials and uh, setting up access control. We have the bootstrap interface that does it. Raw MQTT does not talk about uh, credentials provisioning at all. And AWS provides a separate provisioning service that does it for you. If we talk about the challenge of interoperability, open standard, the first aspect, LWM2M is an open standard, the same for raw MQTT. However, uh, AWS-based uh, MQTT is a proprietary solution. This means that it's, it's a custom protocol made on top of MQTT. And what is also important is that this is not uh, any solution for, that you can take to any other cloud providers. Uh, it will not be working. If you take it, it will not be working out of the box if, if you move from AWS to, to Microsoft Azure. Then non-IP support, part of the uh, LWM2M standard, not defined in MQTT. And for the transport bindings, as we have seen in the previous slide, there are multiple uh, available in raw MQTT and AWS IoT, MQTT only TCP is supported. If we talk about constraint devices, uh, all of these protocols uh, fulfill the requirement of lightweight protocol uh, for MQT, raw MQTT and for both MQTT, there is a very, you know, a very small header and messages. Uh, there is a binary, binary format of the message. Uh, for LWM2M, we have the concise encoding with co-op. Payload encoding, multiple uh, formats supported by LWM2M, JSON, TLV, CBOR, CNML, OPAC. It's undefined, as Sam has mentioned, for raw MQTT. And for AWS IoT, uh, for AWS MQTT, many formats are supported. However, here I'm emphasizing this JSON as it's supported by default and it gives you the possibility to use many of the features provided by AWS out of the box related to uh, rule engines, device shadow, and so on. 
gateway support. Uh, at the moment, not in LWM 2 n but in the version 1.2, it's likely to be supported. For Roam QTT, there is this there, a little bit uh, like a little little brother, little little sister called MQTT SN, and this is also part of the this AWS IoT. And there is also a product called Greengrass that uh, AWS provides that can can play the role of a, of a gateway. Power saving capabilities, lwm 2 m provides the queuing mode, so device can go to sleep. And if there is some information, some message from it from the server, the server queues it until the device wakes up and sends a registration message to the server. And then the, and then the, the server has a chance to, to send the, the to, to deliver the, the, the queued messages to, to the device. And connectionless transport, so this is part of this uh, bindings to, to UDP based. Uh, it's it's uh, saves saves some sort of some part some fraction of the power that you don't need to need to use for establishing the connectivity with the TCP syn synac packets. Uh, no capabilities defined for uh, MQTT, and then AWS uh, provides the queuing mode as well. In terms of scalability, there we talk about resource discovery capabilities, part of LWM 2M standard, not defined in ROAM QTT. And there is some partial uh, functionality of it provided with the device shadow functionality in AWS. And then availability in terms of availability, we talk about monitoring tools and all of these systems support it. Thank you. Sam, now I hand it over to you. Great, thank you. So now that we have done a little bit of uh, comparison between the two protocols, let's talk a bit about what we uh, did in terms of our, our head to head testing here. So our objective was basically to determine the efficiency of lightweight MTM and MQTT clients while simulating a meaningful and realistic IoT deployment. So what we've compared here is we've compared um, basically on a Raspberry Pi as our, as our device. Um, we compared AV Systems on J uh, library with uh, Lightweight MTM 1.1 support, and we compared that to AWS's IoT, um, their SDK, uh, specifically for Python in this particular instance. And at first, this may not seem like the best apples to apples comparison. Um, and we're aware that's because MQTT is probably more from a from a sort of OSI model layer from a technology stack is actually more comparable to to CoAP, which Marcin just did an excellent job describing in detail. Um, but this is not really the way a typical enterprise will make this decision. They're not going to be comparing, contrasting uh, CoAP and MQTT. What they're going to be looking for is to see the sort of overall implementation itself and look for something that's probably a little bit more productized, a little bit more turnkey, um, rather than sort of just taking a raw MQTT broker and building up from there. There certainly are plenty of applications where that is a very valid way to architect. And there are certainly plenty of large enterprises that are working directly with CoAP or directly with MQTT, but that's not the most realistic starting point for most companies. So we wanted to sort of look at an off the shelf, uh, as close to off the shelf as we can get it, comparison of a reference MQTT solution versus a reference lightweight MTM solution. And Azure would have worked quite well as here as well, um, but we chose to use AWS, um, but the sort of same concepts uh, hold. Um, and let's see, and yep, in terms of the Raspberry Pi, we think it's a good device to sort of just demonstrate um, uh, basic implementation. We know that some customers will be looking at much more uh, low power, more constrained devices, MCUs or, or uh, devices that are using LP WAN or CAD M or one of these other sort of more um, uh, power efficient or you know remotely managed uh, scenarios. But for our purposes here, we want to sort of just really look at the implementation uh, itself from the, the client side. So um, if we take a look at the next slide. Let's just uh, run through the the test that we that we conducted, and you can see some of the sort of top line results on the on the right there. So, in terms of our specific tests, we looked at um, and basically packet logged and, and captured um, these various scenarios. The first of which is an initial connection. So, this is basically like a, a cold start for a device. Um, the device will already have been 
provisioned with the, the appropriate platform. So um, in this case, we actually didn't use Bootstrap, but it would have already been bootstrapped. So this is really just about the sort of, yeah, cold start connection to a platform where it already has uh, been authenticated and enrolled. Uh, the next scenario we looked at was uh, what the steady state device connection looked like. So this would be uh, no active reporting, but sort of heartbeats um, or sort of the, the the quote unquote do nothing stage where the device is sort of sitting around either waiting to accept a command or waiting to send an observation, but not actively sending any, uh, any observations northbound. The third scenario we evaluated was uh, the device sending an observation northbound, specifically two updates per minute, so once every 30 seconds. Um, this might seem like a slightly higher refresh frequency for some customers, and for other customers, it may seem like a very low uh, sort of polling or refresh observation frequency. But we think it's sort of representative of the middle of the road, and it's particularly interesting because this is where ultimately many devices will spend the majority of their life cycle. Um, then we looked at a single platform to the device message. And what we really mean here is that this, this could be um, sort of a, a command, you know, to change a reporting frequency or to start initiating a firmware update or to take some action uh, if the IoT device is connected to an actuator of some kind. Um, any sort of platform initiated northbound to southbound message. And this is probably the most isolated pure case of just looking at a single back and forth um, message uh, between the platform and the device. Um, so I think that one's quite interesting. And last but not least, we looked at a variety of OTA firmware update scenarios. We looked at um, both, uh, we looked at using Lightweight M10 both with HTTPS, so you know, traditional TCP with TLS, as the message, as the, sorry, as the firmware delivery combined with co-app for the sort of command and control of the firmware update process. And we also looked at a scenario where we use Lightweight M10 in pure co-app. Um, which is really quite interesting because that's not something that AWS IoT can do or pretty much any MQTT solution can do, uh, which is able to deliver an entire firmware update over the constrained protocol without having to fall back to something like TCP and TLS, which while fine on a Raspberry Pi, um, can be uh, can really introduce some serious overhead if you're dealing with a very constrained MCU or some very low power device. And then we looked at power consumption at, at uh, different reporting intervals to see uh, if we saw any differences in comparisons there. And then um, last, as I said earlier, we looked not just at the technological comparison, but also sort of the business use case comparison. So we did a qualitative evaluation where we looked from, you know, uh, uh, not just the technical perspective, but sort of big picture, we did a business sort of uh, comparison and then a technical comparison at a bit of a higher level as well. And as I said, you can see some of the, the top line results there on the, on the right. But we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into three of these different uh, particular tests that we did. But I encourage you all to download the uh, white paper where we have uh, a lot of data, um, all of the backing for all of this stuff. We have all the graphs and a lot more detailed explanation of the uh, specific scenarios. So with that, let's take a look at the, uh, the first scenario, which I believe is the initial connection. Great. So again, this is um, what we're testing here is the initial connect for a device that was previously onboarded or provisioned. So again, think of it as a cold start. This is also particularly important uh, because if you are bringing a lot of devices online at once, um, if there's a power outage or potentially even after a firmware update um, or some reprovisioning event, this is sort of what you can expect to see. And we, um, I think, I don't know if I mentioned the details, but we basically, uh, captured all of the transmission, all the traffic here, and we're comparing both the uh, the total bytes and in some places we'll be comparing the number of packets. So what did we see here? Uh, we saw that Lightweight MTM had 72% less data transfer than MQTT for this boot up event. And you can also see a little bit on the right, um, the difference in the sort of behavior uh, when the devices came online. Um, in particular, one of the um, one of the factors that makes this so uh, heavy in favor of lightweight MTM is it comes back to to what Marcin was saying earlier about the defined data model and those IPSO objects. And one of the advantages of that is that it's a lot 
it's a lot faster and more efficient to basically say, I'm a device and here are the different types of observations that I can send northbound to the platform because it doesn't have to exchange as much overhead in terms of sort of informing the platform of what to expect. Whereas by default in the AWS IoT implementation, and again, this is sort of the out of the box features fully implemented, sort of following their reference documentation about the way that AWS expects you to implement their device shadow features. Um, and obviously you could just use it in raw MQTT if you wanted, but out of the box, the SDK uh, basically does a, an exchange with the, the shadow service to sort of tell the, the AWS platform what types of data to expect and what the, the shape and schema of that data looks like. And there's a lot of overhead involved in that, in particular because it is JSON. Um, and as Marston said, you don't necessarily have to use JSON as your, your payload within your MQTT packet, but most platforms expect it. And while that's nice in some ways, since um, you know, I think pretty much anyone who's done this type of engineering work or architecting is very familiar with the, the ubiquity of JSON as the sort of the go-to data interchange format, um, the issue is not very, the issue is it's not very efficient. <laughs> so yes, you can use something else, but if you want to use the built-in AWS IoT rules engine, if you want to use their, their thing shadow service, if you want to use, in fact, even their, um, they have sort of a, a framework for, for firmware updates and for basically tasks that can be pushed down to the device, you have to exchange all of that in JSON, or you have to build your own sort of uh, translation layer and you'd have to run that using Lambda functions or some other system to translate that, that data. So again, you don't necessarily have to use JSON, but um, you sort of do in practice. So let's take a look at another scenario, um, which is the, uh, the, the uh, device observations at a fixed rate. So again, one every 30 seconds, two per minute. And here, um, again, we see Lightweight MTM has, has quite an advantage. And this, again, really comes back to, well, there's a few aspects here, but um, part of it has to do with basically TCP and the acknowledgments that are, that are going on. With Lightweight M2M, we're using co-op over UDP, so there's actually no need for an act to come back um, every single time the device wants to send an observation northbound to the platform. Now, with MQTT and TCP, you can't avoid that since it is part of TCP. Um, even if you use QoS zero, you can get away with it to a certain degree, but you still have to deal with the TCP act. Um, and by default, again, with the AWS IT implementation, why you could change this, there's also this uh, shadow update confirmation process when you send a uh, sort of state update to the platform. Now you could probably reduce the overhead in terms of bytes to a certain degree if you were not using the shadow update service and you were talking directly to AWS IoT and ingesting it with you know whatever services you have on the other end and then feeding it into your your platform, your data model, or what have you. Um, but we're trying to compare sort of out of the box functionality. And it's also important to note here that on the lightweight MTEM side, you can configure that kind of ACK behavior over CoAP and UDP if you so desire. Um, so if you want to make sure that every single message has this you know, declarative, okay, uh, you know, device sends a message to the platform, platform can acknowledge and send back to the device to say it got it, but you don't actually have to. And by default, that's actually not enabled. And that's why we see such a large, large delta here. So it's both the differences in the underlying transport protocol, differences in the default implementation, and uh, just the inefficiencies of, of JSON in this particular case. All right, let's take a look at uh, one more scenario. And again, there's a lot more information around this um, in the white paper. So I know if you're trying to extrapolate a little bit further, or you wanna see a little bit more detail, we have, uh, I think, four or five graphs for each one of these topics um, in the white paper. Um, so this is another interesting one, which is the single platform to device message. So as I previously mentioned, this would be something like the platform telling the device to change its reporting interval, maybe to start a firmware update, to do some action. Um, and here we see, you know, it, at its sort of core, the most, um, the most limited, or I should say the most uh, pared down comparison and that there's very little overhead for either one of these protocols uh, 
for this kind of message, which is why I think it's interesting because this is probably one of the sort of purest comparisons of the underlying uh, protocols rather than the out of the box implementations. And both are important. You know, obviously we, we want to understand more about the differences between lightweight MTM and, and MQTT, but looking at a major cloud vendor like AWS, you know, I think it's important also to see their, their default out of the box implementation since many customers, especially those who don't maybe have a lot of strong domain expertise in IoT, they're going to tend to trust their platform vendor and tend to configure things out of the box in the sort of reference manner that the platform vendor provides. So unlike those cases, here we see a smaller difference because this is really um, just a single message, but even here uh, we do see the increased efficiency that Lightweight MTEM has to offer. This is largely down to the encoding scheme. Um, I think it's it's interesting. And one other thing that's, uh, we, we talk about it again, much more detail in the white paper, but it's very worth noting here, since this graph does, does show it, we have a few others that I think describe this a little bit better, but the point is still here, which is if we look at the, the packet size or the packet length in the bottom right there, you can see that there is a variability to the MQTT packet length, packet size. And while you have to take my word for it or, or look at the other graphs to, to see this elsewhere, this is very true across all of our tests, even when we're sending thousands or tens of thousands of packets. Uh, lightweight MTEM is very predictable in that you know exactly what that packet length is going to be in, in general, which may not be so much important for you know uh, an industrial gateway that's connected in a you know in a factory it's connected to a gigabit network to fiber or they probably have local fiber backhaul you know we may not care about that as much but when we think about power constrained devices wireless devices devices that have very limited uh, you know uh, both CPU power but also you know battery life um, it can be very useful to have a predictable packet length because it allows you to optimize your network layer much, much more, uh, with much more granular control than you would otherwise with something like MQTT over TCP. So if you're in an environment where you really need to control everything, where you want to get maximum efficiency out of your radio time so that you're not spinning it up and you don't need to get everything, you know, the, the sort of race to sleep kind of scenario, um, there's a huge advantage here to, to using Lightweight MTM with Co-op. So um, that's a summary of our of three of our results out of uh, the white paper, and I will hand it back now to Marcin. Thanks, Sam, for this very in-depth analysis of MQTT and LWM2M. And in response to these findings, uh, AV System decides to step up and you know build tools to, that can reduce bar barriers for adoption of the LWM2M protocol. The first thing we want to mention here is the, our LWM2M client SDK called Anj. It's an open source library with compatible with the C99 standard. Uh, there is a support for with full compliance with LWM2M version 1.1 of the protocol. Multiple sub hardware architectures are supported as well as multiple operating systems and multiple cryptographic libraries. And if you start using it, uh, there is a very easy migration because the API is unified from the free version to commercial version. Uh, the second thing is that if you want to start building an application, you want to play with it while you develop it. So for so the client is not enough. You, you need a server because you want to see how you are progressing. You want to see if things are if you are setting them in the device, are you able to track them on the server side? And if you are able to send commands from the server, are you able to change things in your device? So to facilitate this, we are also announcing a launch of our free Try Anj platform. If you want to use it for to, to help you building and testing your, your application, all you need to do is just register with your email under this link. And we will send you automatically link that will give you access to the service. And this access is, is for lifetime. And finally, uh, if you are, we are also announcing uh, an open source embed OS client based on the, our Anji library. Uh, so if you think about using embed OS as your IoT platform, then it might be a, a good starting point for you. We, at the moment, we provide the integration with the STM32 
L4 boards. There are many sensors available on these boards. Uh, if you if you start if you start by, by by using this integration, you get the network layer adaptation between ANJ and uh, and the underlying uh, network drivers out of the box. You are able to understand the hardware abstraction that are part of the inter in interaction between the ANJ library and the sensors. And thanks to this, you you will be able to to, to better understand it and how to, it will be easier for you to play with the sensors. And uh, there are more resources from us to come in the coming weeks. So please stay tuned. And we are also looking for, for questions and, and the requests that you might want to have that can help us all build a proper ecosystem around LWM 2M protocol. Thanks everybody for, for this, this time and we are all happy to answer all your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, I will be sharing uh, the questions uh, now. Okay. So, so the first question from Steve Hilton. Um, interesting. So Steve said, is there a way to use lightweight M2M and MQTT together? Can they be used in implementation to complement each other? Um, I don't know, Marcin, do you have any thoughts on that? I have maybe a few. So, uh, as, as we have, you know, already spoken on you know, that MQTT is more of a transport layer, transport data protocol. And uh, LWM2M is about managing your resources in your device. But currently, there is an ongoing work on the specification of version 1.2 for the LWM2M. And surprisingly, surprise, surprise, this protocol, this LWM2M M2, LWM version 1.2, can be run on top of MQTT. So uh, basically, we will have an MQTT protocol and then payload of the MQTT will be will be just LWM2M. Which is interesting then, because I think that would maybe allow customers to use a generic high performance broker, but still be able to pass along lightweight M2M messages, um, maybe to a different uh, device management platform. Um, let's see. Is there a difference between co-op and lightweight M2M? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think Marcia, maybe you can you can elaborate more, but uh, effectively co-op is is the the sort of messaging transport that lightweight M2M sits on top of. So it's different layers of the stack, effectively. But maybe Marcia, if yeah. you want to elaborate. I think we can illustrate it better with with comparing it to to the thing. To HTTP and and the world and the web world of web, so we have HTTP that is transforming the HTML code of the web page, uh, and inside the HTTP message there there is HTML code. And in our example, we have a co-op that provides the same functionality as HTTP for transporting data. And inside the payload of co-op, we have the LWM2M message. I think this this makes a this makes a, a good illustration. Excellent. Um, let's see. Um, what do you call non-IP? Um, I'm not sure of the full context there, but generally we refer to non-IP as anything that's not using TCP/IP, uh, so basically not using TCP or UDP as the underlying transport. Um, I don't know, Marcin, do you have any other thoughts about what, what you would define non-IP as? Uh, so one of these technologies that, that we were defined as part of the OWM2M is LoRa. So this is a protocol for sort of you know, long-range communication, uh, which does not use IP over it. There is a cellular IoT, but also no IP can be Bluetooth. For example, you can you can run some custom protocol on top of Bluetooth 
ba basically non 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 IP would be would be any solution that that does not does not use IP or Z wave or Zigbee or anything yeah yeah for example for example um, looks like a question did you the, did you do the test over a mobile network um, and then follow up UDP over cellular does that exist so uh, these particular tests, no, we did them over a wired network. Um, there were a variety of reasons for that. Um, primarily, it was to ensure uh, consistent behavior effectively. Um, we did do a little bit of evaluation um, around trying to use a CADAM network, um, but there were a few difficulties we ran into in just sort of the initial setup there. And even though we did have some solutions to pack or capture that. It was also a little bit more difficult to get that together. So effectively for the sake of sort of overall fairness and efficiency to make sure that there was no issues with fragmentation or receive window sides and sort of let the clients do what they wanted to do by default and eliminate the network layer sort of as a factor in our comparisons, we did not use them over cellular. Um, and then the follow-up was UDP over cellular, does that exist? Um, I believe it does, but I'm not sure, Marcin, if you have an idea. Thoughts on that, UDP over cellular? Uh, well, you would need to have IP in between, right? Yes. Uh, but then, and then what, what's the point, right? If, if we agree that this cellular part is part of this non-IP data delivery, then, then it's not existing then. At least I have not, I have not seen this. As a, yeah, as I'm a, not sure either. I mean, I know a little bit about it when we talk about things like VPN, but... Um, I know you can make a UDP connection over cellular. I guess I don't know what it's going on at the underlying level there and how it translates that to sort of the underlying messaging. Um, looks like the next question uh, is is for you, Marcin. Um, they say, do AV system does AV systems trial deployment environment also support other programming languages like Python or C Sharp .NET? Uh, at the moment, not and uh, we don't have any immediate plans uh, regarding it uh, but it's it's a good then uh, input for us that this might be something worth considering uh, but we are also we are thinking uh, at the moment a little bit about providing python bindings but this is not yet not yet decided um another question i think for you it says does the Anjay client uh, already work with LoRa WAN. So I guess is there is there inbuilt integration for LoRa? Uh, not to my knowledge at the moment. Um, question for me: it Says were the tests done with MQTT or MQTT SN? Um, they were done with MQTT. So uh, we tried to stay as much sort of out of the box as possible. We're very well aware that there are many different ways to optimize uh, these two different solutions and these two different stacks. Um, but we did it with the default, which is just MQTT 311 uh, with TLS over TCP. Let's see. Uh, Daniel says, Lightweight MTEM is being constantly updated with more and more functionality. Initially, there was only UDP or SMS as a transport layer. Now we have a few non IP options as well and ITD options as well. Um, as well as TCP, you said that in the next Lightweight MTEM version, there was going to be HTTP available. Wouldn't that make Lightweight MTEM no longer a lightweight protocol, but a heavyweight one? So maybe Marcin, you want to talk a bit about, you know, where the intersection um, and upcoming versions is of Lightweight MTEM and the sort of traditional RESTful model? Uh, right. So, uh, as I think, as we as we spoke, that there is that co-op, and LWM term over co-op is sort of the next der derived sort of or based on the on the REST model, and there is a strong interoperability between HTTP and co-op. So you can think about co-op as HTTP for constrained environments, and there is an easy of translation of requests and methods. And HTTP, uh, if if you know that the logic with co-op is, is so similar, then then the question is, why not? If the device has capabilities to process it, and the, both the processing overheads and communication overheads, and then the main advantage of this would be you know that there are so many you know widely deployed 
HTTP libraries in so many places. So, so the adoption of it would be, would be very quick. But definitely, it's not going to be a solution for, for very constrained environments. Yeah, just, just to add on to that, it's, it's interesting. Um, one of the things that we, we hear, not super frequently, but that we definitely encounter, are IoT solutions that only support uh, RESTful interfaces, which uh, seems a little bit odd uh, at first blush, just because there are other protocols and other solutions available. So you might say, why would you go with RESTful? And the, the reality is, is simply interoperability. Uh, standardization and as Marcin said the the fact that you know having a, a restful library an HTTP library is probably the probably the most common library you can find in every language in every environment everywhere and they're heavily optimized so while it's certainly not lightweight and certainly will not work well on a constrained device um, you do see a surprising desire for things like um, you know restful support in IOT devices um, even if it's not from a technological technology perspective, is not the most efficient solution. So, I could definitely see the interest in trying to uh, blend those a bit a bit more tightly where possible when we're not talking about constrained devices. Um, looks like another question uh, for you, Marson. Uh, where does lightweight M to M as a technology end and AV system begin? Or in other words, can you say some more words about your offerings? Uh, okay, so uh, we have you know this product portfolio of three three main products that, that we are offering around our IoT solutions that are heavily focused around LWM to M. One is the library, the client side that I already explained, Anjay. One is, is openly open source, available as part of the op our op open source portfolio. If you need to have some more sophisticated solutions uh, like compliance with 1.1 1 .1, uh, version protocol of LWM2M and non IP data delivery support. Uh, probably some more sophisticated security features. This is part of our commercial offering. And then we have also the, the system for device management and monitoring. We called it Coyote, Coyote, Coyote DM. Uh, from there, you can monitor and manage your devices. You can execute over the air updates. Uh, you can see how your system is working. You can you, you basically, this is, this is the system that allows you to do whatever you want with, in terms of device management and data monitoring. And then our third offering is the extension to this DM. We call it Coyote DO, data orchestration. It provides integration with uh, additional third party systems. So that, and then also integration with our DM so that you can, based on this enriched data sets, uh, provide some analytics tools that will help you uh, make more informed business decisions to, to develop your IoT system. Great. Um... Okay, there still are a few questions, but we're aiming for an hour webinar. So just because we will not be able to answer everyone's questions, uh, we will get big, um, as I said in the beginning, um, getting back to you uh, via email. Um, and yes, we will also be sharing the recording of today's webinar um, along with the, the links uh, to the things we mentioned in the webinar just to answer some, some questions.